So this webinar is being brought to you by NEBOG, the New England Ener excuse me, the New England Biological Assessment of Wetlands Workgroup, which is coordinated by NUIPIC. Today's three presentations are all about streams and wetlands in New York. Each will be about 15 minutes, again followed by a few questions. So first from New York City DEP, we welcome Laurie Machang to present conditional assessment and LIDAR-based mapping of wetlands in the New York City water supply watershed. Next, also from New York City, but in the Parks Department, we will hear from Emily Steven on New York City Parks Stream Rapid Assessment. And finally, from New York State, DEC, Hudson River Estuary Program, and a fellow Newey Pick employee, we have Megan Lung, who will be presenting the Culvert Connection, Ecology, and Resiliency. You can find more information on these projects and the presenters in the handout section of the control panel, as well as on the NEBOG website, which is accessible via the shortened URL that you see there at the bottom of the screen. So without further ado, I will pass things over to Lori Machang for our first presentation. And give me just one moment while we make that switch. Audra, thanks for organizing this today and thanks for inviting me to speak. And I'm just gonna jump right in because I have two projects to cover. I'm having some trouble advancing my slides. You may need to just click on it and then move it forward. Let's just see. There we go. Okay, so um, I thought I'd start out with some uh, a brief overview of the New York City watershed. Um, I'm not sure that um, everyone online is familiar with New York City's water supply. So New York City gets its drinking water from upstate watershed areas um, located up to about 125 miles north and west of the city. Um, on the west side of the Hudson River, um, we have our west of Hudson district, and the westernmost reservoir basins in that um, flow into the Delaware River, and on the, the eastern side of, the, of that west of Hudson district flows into the Hudson River. So east of the Hudson River, we have our east of Hudson district, um, and that is comprised primarily of waters that feed the Croton River. <clears throat> Sorry. So to give you um, a little closer look, um, this is a 2,000 square mile area on both sides of the river. It includes 19 reservoirs and three controlled lakes. And it um, serves over, provides about 9 million people with over 1.1 um, billion gallons of drinking water per day. The Catskill um, portion, the Catskill Delaware portion, which is that west of Hudson portion, um, you can pro you'll probably hear me use those terms interchangeably today. So when I'm talking about Cat Dell, I'm generally talking about that west of Hudson portion. That provides 90% um, of the water supply and is unfiltered. Um, the city has been operating this water supply under a filtration avoidance determination since 1993. So that's a determination under the uh, surface water treatment rule of the Safe Drinking Water Act. And as part of that filtration avoidance determination, we have numerous programs in place to maintain the high quality of, of the surface waters in the watershed. And this slide just lists a few. There are many more and um, each program on its own would be the subject of its own presentation, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview. We have watershed rules and regulations in the watershed in place, and they're designed to prevent degradation of water quality from wastewater and stormwater impacts that would be associated with development. We have a very um, active land acquisition program in the watershed. We've acquired uh, over 150,000 acres and on city owned lands in the watershed, um, there are about 5,000 acres of wetlands. So we have about 15% of the watershed wetlands protected on our lands. We have watershed agriculture and forestry programs. Um, and those programs, we, we work with partners who ensure the use of BMPs on private properties in the watershed to protect water quality um, during agriculture and forestry operations. We have our own forest management program where we're conducting silviculture on city lands um, to promote um, healthy, vigorous forest growth, also protective of water quality, and also ensuring the implementation of BMPs 
And um, I just wanted to point out that for DEP silvicultural pro um, projects on our lands, wetlands are um, exclusion zones in which no silviculture is conducted. And we have a stream management program also working with partners and to develop um, stream basin management plans as well as conduct restoration projects on individual reaches in the watershed. And of course, we have a wetlands protection program and the wetlands protection program, its, its goal is, is pretty obvious. It's to protect wetlands and the ecosystem services they provide um, towards improving water quality in the watershed. And our strategy for wetlands protection has always been to, to collect um, robust information about the condition of wetlands through wetland monitoring and the extent and the distribution of wetlands through, through wetlands mapping. And by providing all this strong base information, we really benefit the implementation of these various um, programs that I mentioned previously, because each one of those programs has an element that is protective of wetlands. Um, so data sources um, in the New York City watershed for wetlands, we got the, the National Wetlands Inventory. Um, it was last updated in 2005 using 2003 and 2004 photography. And we also have the state's regulatory um, coverage, um, the New York State DEC freshwater wetland maps. And that generally includes wetlands that are 12.4 acres and larger, although we do have some smaller wetlands of unusual local importance. So in total, you see we have about 35,000 acres of wetlands mapped in the watershed. And it's interesting, if you look at the east of Hudson line, the top line, you'll see that the east of Hudson watershed has about twice the acreage of the west of Hudson watershed, despite being significantly smaller. And so there's about 6% um, of the land surface is covered in wetlands east of Hudson versus like one to two west. And that's you know due to the mountainous terrain of, of the Catskill area. Um, so in 2009, we had a data collection that was a bit of a game changer for us. Um, we collected high resolution um, ortho imagery with a simultaneous LIDAR flight. And several products were derived from those data sources. And I'm just gonna list a few here today that are relevant to the talk I'm giving. Um, we got a digital elevation model with, and two foot contours, and we got high resolution land cover and land use and impervious surface data and also a local resolution national hydrography database was created. Um, that NHD data um, added about 650 miles of streams, mapped streams to our GIS, and that was an 18% increase in stream length in certain parts of the watershed, so it was significant. So looking at um, all of those data sources and the great products that were derived from it, I was, I was wanting to pursue whether um, those data could also increase the completeness and accuracy of wetland maps for the watershed. So we set out to do a pilot. And the wetland mapping part of that pilot had three major objectives. And one was to evaluate that source LIDAR data and see if it, if it could support wetland mapping. The LIDAR data wasn't collected with the intention to, to, um, to, to conduct wetland mapping. So it was important that we pursue that. And then we wanted to see if we could develop an automated modeling protocol to use instead of or in addition to um, standard classic photo interpretation methods to map wetlands. And then we knew that anything that we did through an automated modeling protocol was going to require some manual cleanup. And before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that this pilot was completed through work with our contractors, our partners at Ground Point and the University of Vermont and Quantum Spatial. They're the real experts here. I'm just reporting on uh, at a general level on their findings. I'm not gonna talk about the evaluation of the source LIDAR data, except to say that we didn't really find any problems with the coverage of LIDAR, the thoroughness of the coverage in terms of voids and point densities, but we did find that the LIDAR intensity signal couldn't be used so much for this purpose, but that was not um, a game stopper for us. <clears throat> so a big important component of the um, compound, of, of the automated mapping process was the development of this compound topographic index. And this, this is modeling flow accumulation, flow direction and accumulation um, from upslope areas. So it's a flow accumulation model derived from the DEM. And um, 
the contractors, they messed around with resolution level and they actually found that the lower three meter resolution CTI was going to be a better predictor at separating. It had the most contrast. It would separate the wetland from its adjacent up, upland from a modeling perspective. I have um, some literature references that the contractors provided on the development of this. If anyone is interested, you can email me afterwards. My email is at the end of this talk. So I'm going to take you through my high level understanding of um, how they how they did the modeling. And they used um, object based image analysis and that uses multiple GIS data sources to group pixels into objects. And so they started out with a protocol that would first throw out any improbable areas like steep slopes and impervious surfaces. And then from there, um, <clears throat> pixels are grouped into objects based on the similarity of, of, of features that are divine, defined in the model. And then from those objects, um, the model would create wetland features using the CTI texture that I was just mentioning. Um, near infrared characteristics that they programmed in and other features, I'm sure. And finally, for those wetland features, um, they were classified using height, and that was also derived from the um, the lidar point cloud data from which you can derive vegetation height. So that's a really simplistic overview. A um, couple points about this is they did design it to overmap wetlands because it's much easier to clean up errors of commission than it is to go looking for sites that you may have missed. And they also were able to use a single rule set um, for the east of Hudson and west of Hudson um, watersheds, despite those differences in terrain that I was talking about earlier, the mountainous terrain versus the rolling topography of the Croton. Now we do have a um, nice, a, a fair amount of field data because of that work we do for our forestry delineations. We go out and we delineate the boundaries of, of wetlands for our foresters. And so I was able to use that compiled um, database of delineations to evaluate this model output. So this is an example of a forest uh, management project in the Ashokan Basin. And this is what our current NWI has mapped as present. And then this is what our field work showed us was really present. And the next slide I'm going to show you is the model output. And I'll call your attention to that evergreen area on the bottom of the screen. So the model did a really good job of, of pointing out that there were potential wetlands in, in these evergreen areas. And we found that time and time again that the model was doing a really good job in areas that would have some flow accumulation, but that you wouldn't be able to visually detect it using standard photo interpretation because of that evergreen canopy masking the hydrologic signature. But where the model you know, didn't do as well, it's not really surprising, it's these small little patches and also wetlands that um, are, are slope wetlands that are you know, wetlands that owe their existence to groundwater sleeps, uh, seeps rather than to flow accumulation. So it's no surprising that a flow accumulation driven model wouldn't detect a slope wetland. So after, um, after the model output was, after the modeling was completed, um, the contractors did go in, in in 15 pilot areas and back a few slides, I showed some red boxes on the map. Those were the, the pilot areas and they did manual editing. So in order to take that model from that blocky output you just saw into something that could be an NWI compliant product if you wish. So they cleaned up the errors of omission and commission and they attributed it according to the federal geographic data standard, you know, put coordinate codes on it. And all said and done in those 15 pilot areas, we did see a 136% increase in mapped wetlands in the west of Hudson um, pilot areas and a 75% increase east of Hudson. And so we went ahead and did a, an accurate, a feature accuracy assessment. And we saw that the 2005 NWI had a feature accuracy of about 78% on both sides of the river, but the LIDAR accuracy um, under, under this protocol, the accuracy increased to 86% west of Hudson and 93% east of Hudson. So this is a, a very promising method that we um, are now um, currently working towards implementing throughout the entire watershed. 
and I'm going to do a real quick pivot on you to the other project I wanted to talk to you about, and that is our wetland monitoring program. <clears throat> so we've been monitoring about 19 wetlands since 2004, and from that, a pretty big database of um, wetland plants, wetland vegetation, soil data, hydrology from long-term monitoring wells, and water quality. And this has certainly been a very useful database for us in establishing reference standards that we've used to guide um, restoration and, and mitigation projects in the watershed and to relate uh, wetland um, extent and conditions to water quality features such as DOC export. But what we haven't had is um, a way of kind of simplifying this data into some tangible metrics to start describing the condition of wetlands in the watershed. So we're, we're really excited by work that the um, Heritage Program has put out and in, the, in the last few years. And on the right, you'll see a, a paper that you can find on the Heritage Program's website. And it's their summary of conditional assessment methodology uh, for New York State. Um, I'll refer you to their, um, to their website and to this paper for, for the details. But um, I'll just give a brief overview and talk about how we hope to implement it. So they have a land, they have a multi-tiered approach, um, and at the level one is the broad landscape scale, and they've created a model um, that depicts cumulative stressors for pixels based on statewide GIS coverages such as transportation, infrastructure, and development. Um, they have a more intermediate scale that also has an on-screen component but it has a field component where you're um, basically going in the field and tallying stressors at a wetland assessment area and its immediate buffer. And then they have a more, um, more intensive quantitative veg vegetative sampling, rapid um, intensive approach. So for that, they're monitoring plots, uh, recording species and multiple measures of those species abundance. So <clears throat> I've been looking a lot at this and um, wondering how I can take, if I can take this this backlog of reference wetland data that I have and, and plug it into this method and, and what that looks like. And so what I've concluded is that obviously I can do level one work in the watershed immediately because that's data that they've, they've created and put out there. Um, level two, I don't quite have the field um, data collection on the buffers that this method um, requires, but that's certainly easy enough for me to go get because it is their rapid assessment method. And level three, I have, um, you know, I have vegetation plot data around from my sites. And so I've been playing around a little bit with, with plugging it in and seeing how it looks compared to state. And I'll very briefly, because um, I'm going over my time, just Level one, um, these are just quick results. This is that landscape um, condition assessment scores. And um, the sites are, are um, sorted by their cover type here, grouped by cover type. And then the bars are color coded by thresholds that the, um, that the heritage publication establishes. So no surprise, uh, many of our sites are in good to fair condition. And I just wanted to give you a visual because I think this visual relays um, how effective that level one tool is in relaying um, wetland condition. So on the left, we have a site that's on state lands in the Ashokan. It's a primarily forested buffer and it's got a LCA score of 80, which is, which is probably near pristine by heritage standards. And then on the right, we have another site that's on a conservation easement in which we have some agricultural use. And this, the landscape score is a 740 and reflects that well. So I think this is a really effective tool for sort of relaying buffer conditions into a singular metric that can be um, readily plugged into um, other statistical analyses in the future. And real quick, uh, level three, when I plugged my data in and started calculating, these are the same sites in the same order. Um, this is a mean coefficient of conservatism. Um, you see, um, you know, I've got some sites that are, are dinging in the red zone according to the heritage thresholds. I don't necessarily think that these sites are in poor condition. I think that these scores are relict of sampling differences in our methodology. And I'll just really quick show you um, this, the, the differences in the methodology that I think affect the outcome of these level three scores. The Natural Heritage Program, 
that that grid you see that that's a representation of what they do they sample um, their method requires um, sampling a constant area for for all sites regardless of size and DEP has been using a releve based on a 50 meter grid so we're always sampling a constant percentage um, but not a constant area so that's an important difference and with this approach you know I see that we really we have um, multiple plot um, sizes for strata in our approach and we have a one meter squared herb and then a three meter radius for trees and 10 for plots and I see that we're really relative to what the heritage program does under sampling our emergent layer um, our herbaceous layer which is, is probably where those lower sea values are coming in so again I'm just going to summarize quickly um, we are looking to advance our wetland mapping and monitoring with new techniques such as LIDAR and conditional assessment as they become available. Um, that LIDAR-based modeling approach really we, it was um, increased the completeness and accuracy of wetland maps in the watershed. And we believe a NWI compliant product can come out of that through manual edit, editing. <clears throat> I didn't get to talk about wetland connectivity, but suffice it to say that that um, NHD data really increases our ability to detect wetland connectivity rates in the watershed. And um, when we plug in the heritage's methods, we're seeing a good to moderate conditioning on a landscape scale. And any kind of disagreements between what the landscape scale and the plot scale is telling us at this point, I believe is just relic of sampling difference um, in our methodology. So, as I mentioned a few times, we're going to plug that, um, we're going to apply that LIDAR wetland mapping work across the watershed, and we're going to continue to evaluate the application of those conditional assessment metrics in the watershed and see how they can benefit our programs, and we will evaluate and adjust our um, long-term monitoring methods as we need, and I'm excited to say that we're going to be doing all this in a partnership with the New York Natural Heritage Program. We're going to start working together more closely. And um, just want to close by saying this improved understanding of wetland distribution and condition is, is really um, going to be beneficial to the implementation of watershed protection programs. Uh, thank you so much, Lori. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, welcome. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And thank you, Audra, for organizing this. Thank you, Lori, for a really interesting talk. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about a stream assessment project that we're doing um, within New York City. I work for New York City Park. So to dive in, um, just to give you some context of the breakdown of land in New York City. So about 60% is built infrastructure and about 40% is green. Um, of that, about three quarters are landscaped green areas, kind of like Central Park type of stuff, and then a quarter of that is natural spaces. So that's a bit over 20,000 acres. And just for some context, Parks um, manages about 30,000 acres, which is roughly 15% of the land area in New York City. And my division, which is forestry, horticulture, and natural resources, uh, manages about 10,000 of those acres. So within that land, we have grassland, wetlands, uh, freshwater streams, freshwater and tidal wetlands, and a bunch of forests as well. And in the upper right corner, I have a breakdown of uh, where the streams, the freshwater streams fall within those land uses. Um, within New York City, we have about 112 freshwater stream miles, and about 14 of them fall on private property. 94 of them fall on public property, and of that, about two-thirds are on parks property. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today, is those roughly 60 miles of freshwater streams on park land currently. And as I said, this is a stream assessment project. So the goals of the project were to assess the condition of the streams, to really inventory what we have, um, and create a comprehensive framework for the type of stream that we have, the extent of its impacts, and overall how it's doing in relation to everything else. Um, and that would allow us to identify strategies to better manage the streams, whether we're concerned about stormwater inputs, buffer management, or if it's just a really nice stream we want to maintain um, and keep protected. 
And when we really boil it down, um, once we figure out sort of a framework uh, using this protocol, we can then develop site-specific recommendations uh, based on those strategies. And just to give you an idea of kind of what we used to have, um, using the Wilikia data source, which looks at pre-development pre um, 1600s, uh, when we had, like, the freshwater streams we had in New York City, we had about 240 stream miles, and now we have less than half of that. And this slide just shows a breakdown of where most of that stream loss has occurred. Um, Manhattan has almost no freshwater streams left. Um, Staten Island is doing pretty well, and you can see actually uh, our current length of freshwater streams exceeds what we had historically in Staten Island, and that's just because of stormwater conveyance streams that have popped up. Um, but in the other boroughs, we've seen a dramatic loss of streams. And most of you probably understand this, but we value our streams for ecosystem services, um, stormwater management and temperature regulation, as well as biodiversity. I'll talk a bit more about the cool things we found in the streams that we assess. Um, and as the Parks Department, we are always concerned with um, providing access to people, um, whether that be freshwater streams or forests, et cetera. And when, we, when I'm talking about stream impacts, a lot of what we're talking about is maybe unique to the city where we have a ton of garbage. Uh, these are all also photos from our stream assessments. Uh, we see evidence of high storm flows where in that upper right photo, uh, the bank is undercut and there's a lot of erosion and incision in the bank. We also see streams flowing through things like golf courses, so a lack of sufficient buffers um, whether they be full of invasive species or are just not adequately large um, to protect the streams. And we see a lot of stormwater, uh, stormwater pipes or just a large impervious area contributing to the stream, which I'll talk about in a bit. So our field approach was to break down our freshwater streams into reaches, and we defined reaches as an area of relatively homogeneous uh, stream characteristics, so similar slope, similar stream bed type, um, which didn't exceed 20 times uh, the stream width, so the length could not exceed 20 times the width of the stream. And once we broke down each reach, we divided it into quarters and uh, defined three transects that we were going to do measurements on. Um, all of these transects we did physical measurements on, which I will show a diagram of in the next slide. And the middle transect we did a more intensive um, macroinvertebrate study and looked at vegetation and tree canopy and vegetation along the banks. So this is our channel geometry physical characterization that we did at all three transects. So we looked at things like bankful width and height, bank angle, bank height, the rooted depth, and in that middle transect, we did also did a pebble count to define the substrate type. And in that middle transect, we also looked at vegetation. We looked at the riparian vegetation along the banks and identified invasive species. Um, on the right, you can see the bottom right photos of Japanese knotweed, so that was one that we focused on. We also looked at in-stream canopy cover, so we took photos from the middle of the stream up and then used software to determine the percentage of tree canopy cover. And we also did GIS analysis of the natural buffer coverage, so we looked within 30 meters of the stream bank uh, to see how much of that was natural or vegetated. And then we also did tick samples to look for benthic invertebrates. And where we found salamanders, we did salamander counts as well. And when looking at impacts, we looked at a landscape analysis of the impervious cover within the drainage area to each reach. So that's how we defined um, one of the impacts of development to that stream reach. 
And we also looked while we were in the field at evidence of stormwater outfalls coming into those stream reaches. And wherever there were collapsed or broken pipes or sheens and odors, we also noted that as evidence of impact. We also, in order to figure out what types of streams we had, we did a sediment-based classification system. Some of you may be familiar with uh, classification systems like Roskin, but since we're in the city, we don't have a good variety of slopes of streams, and so a lot of our streams would kind of fall within one particular type of Roskin classification. So we felt that sediment-based classification was more appropriate for the study. And it also allowed us to stratify um, where we found macroinvertebrates in our benthic sampling, because you wouldn't expect to find the same types of macroinvertebrates in a gravel cobble system as you would in a silt sand system. And when we looked at the breakdown of sediment type, we found that most of, most of our stream reaches fell within the sand gravel classification, so in between silt and sand and gravel cobble. Um, and we also had a small percentage that had concrete bottom, so we wouldn't have expected to find uh, macroinvertebrates in there. So once we looked at all of those conditions and impacts, um, I'll just briefly go over the, the condition metrics that we use. So we developed a benthic index based on what we found in our macroinvertebrate sampling and also looked at EPT, which just highlights the more uh, pollution sensitive uh, macroinvertebrates that we found. And then also looked at entrenchment ratio, so basically looked at how incised the banks were. We looked at percent knotweed cover that we found in the reach, and that natural buffer metric looked at a 30 meter buffer along the stream bank and also the in-stream canopy percentage from the photos we took. And then to categorize impact, we looked at two metrics. We looked at discharge pipes observed along the reach and within the reach, as well as the impervious cover percentage in the drainage area. And we normalized all these using z-scores um, against all of the other streams that we assessed. So in total, we I believe assessed 181 stream reaches, which totaled up to about 27 miles. So that's almost half of the 60 miles of stream we have on parks property. So we had pretty good coverage. Um, yeah, and the only, the only metric, again, that we stratified was the, that benthic index because we couldn't compare different substrate types um, with the benthic sampling. And just to give an idea of what our impervious cover percentages look like, um, we had, so these are the drainage areas to each reach, and some of them are nested because we defined uh, reaches as, again, those contiguous homogeneous sections. So some of these are nested, but it just gives you an idea of the spread of A, where our reaches were, and B, where we see most impervious area. Um, so most of our reaches were on Staten Island, and you can see there's a wide variety of percent impervious cover uh, within our drainage areas. And there is some debate uh, within the literature about what a good threshold for impervious percentage is when it will cause um, degradation on streams. So somewhere between 10 and 20% is where you start to see um, that irreversible damage. And so I just did a quick calculation of, um, we had about 12 and a half stream miles where their drainage area exceeded 20% impervious. So that's about 50% of our stream length that we assessed. And above 10 is 63% uh, of the stream length that we assess. So uh, not surprisingly, a lot of our streams are heavily impacted um, by impervious area and development. As I mentioned earlier, we use this EPT index to identify especially high quality streams. 
So that's looking at mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies as especially intolerant to pollution. So we found those in 29 reaches, again, of the roughly 180 that we assessed. And many of those were found in the green belt of Staten Island. So that's right in the center of Staten Island, a complex of parks. We also found salamanders in 14 reaches, again, mainly in the green belt of Staten Island. So um, unsurprisingly, that's an area that is forever wild and has not seen a whole lot of development. So most of those streams are in very good condition. And once we got a total condition score and impact score for each of our reaches, we were able to plot them on this gradient. Um, where we could look at how the condition score and impact score related to each other. And then we classified them into four quadrants. So we had a high condition, low impact, which was our best quality streams in the upper left uh, quadrant. Then below that, we have a low condition but low impact set of streams, which hasn't really seen too many effects of development or stormwater, but it's still for whatever reason in lower condition. And the upper right, we have high condition, high impact. So maybe those streams in drainage areas that haven't seen, have seen more recent development that have not yet degraded. And then bottom right, we have low condition, high impact streams. So th these are the worst um, condition, worst quality streams. So this allows us to develop this management framework where we identify those upper left quadrants as those streams we would like to protect. Bottom left is the low condition, low impact, where we would maybe want to manage buffer or try to improve condition. And then upper right is high condition, high impact. So managing stormwater might help us maintain that good condition that we're seeing. And then the bottom right is, are those streams that need a little bit more help. So they might need some rehabilitation, stream reconstruction type of interventions. So for each reach, we looked at the condition and impact and developed a preliminary suggestion based on that framework in the previous slide. And then we looked at all of those and in the cases where the suggested action wasn't feasible or would not be recommended, we adjusted to a final action. For instance, if we knew that um, a lot of the poor condition was direct contributions of stormwater, we would then adjust to manage stormwater because um, that's a more feasible action. So this is how it ended up breaking down. Um, the yellow dots are our protect reaches, so you can see those are largely confined to that upper left quadrant, but not exclusively. There are also some um, to the right which are observing higher impact. And then orange is managed buffers, so those generally are in the bottom left quadrant, but again, um, kind of spread out based on the feasibility and um, what we know would be a maybe potentially better management route. And you can see also in a lot of cases we recommend managing stormwater. Um, these actions aren't mutually exclusive, so we can do a combination of stormwater and buffer management depending on what we're seeing. So basically our classification gives us a, a first path at understanding the relationship between condition and impact in streams, but then we went back through and really identified where we would like to do to prioritize certain actions. And these were our results. So again, we have protect, manage buffer, manage stormwater, and rehabilitate. And I added another action of in-stream structures. So these are reaches where we think that installing in-stream structures, um, for instance, large woody debris would really enhance habitat complexity and improve condition. So I just have the length of priority streams and then the total stream length um, in this table. And you can see we prioritize most of our streams to be protected um, because a lot of them are actually in really good shape. And so we would like to minimize development in their contributing areas. And 
Yeah, and um, you know, just over one mile of priority for manage buffer, manage stormwater, and rehabilitate. Although, you know, there are obviously more, but these were the priorities we identified for various reasons. And this is just a schematic to show you kind of how all of the actions relate to each other. So we looked at the condition index, for instance, on the left, and that translated, along with the impact, into a recommended action. So here are some examples of streams we would like to protect. So these are really high condition streams. We would want to make sure they stay high condition streams, both because they are already really nice and they um, feed into other streams that might require more intervention. And then here's two examples of, um, well, one that has a nice buffer and one that the bottom, which has presumably a lot of invasives along the bank. Another good example of a buffer management would be if the buffer is too narrow, uh, like in a golf course or something like that. So we can also identify stormwater management opportunities, um, looking at where we think green infrastructure interventions would be feasible. So this is a schematic that shows um, like putting in a curb cut or a rain garden would help improve condition downstream and minimize stormwater impacts uh, in that reach. And we also have a few reaches in that low condition, high impact scenario where um, they need a lot more help. So on the bottom left, you see an encroachment. Uh, someone has sort of a deck jutting out into the stream and think they're falling into it, debris. Um, so that would require more intervention. Similarly, the top image, the bank is just really unvegetated, um, really eroded. So our capacity for, um, for doing simple buffer management or stormwater management is sort of limited in cases where the streams look like that. So this is a very comprehensive stream assessment that we've done. Um, there are similar types of frameworks in place for forests and salt marshes, but this is the one that we did for streams to be able to prioritize management efforts. And unsurprisingly, the most undeveloped watershed contains the highest condition stream. Um, so that was a good predictor for condition, was actually looking at the development and impervious area uh, contributing to these streams. And something surprising we found was that golf courses contained a lot of biodiversity, even though they have very small natural buffers. So just points to the resilience of um, some of our ecosystems here. It's kind of interesting. And then in terms of opportunities and actions uh, for the future, this gives us good guidance on where we want to target stream restoration, enhancement and protection, and also gives us an idea of which streams we need to make sure are protected um, and regulated because a lot of them are small headwaters and aren't protected by state or federal regulation. So um, giving us an idea if we overlay uh, those types of regulations and what's under whose jurisdiction um, gives us an idea of where we can target our efforts in the most vulnerable situations. So that's it for me. Um, this is a salamander we found in the green belt. And there's my email along with the wetlands program manager and the chief of natural resources. So we hope to publish this um, sometime soon and this will be available, all of our analyses and results. So thank you everyone. So thanks Lori and thanks Emily and thanks Audra for hosting. Um, like Audra said, my name is Megan Lung. I'm um, with the Hudson River Estuary Program, which is a program of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And I'm also a satellite New EPIC staff member here in New Paltz. Um, so just a quick outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Estuary Program and what we do. So we're going to zoom all the way back out to look at the Hudson River Estuary Watershed from kind of bird's eye view. 
We're going to talk about aquatic barriers. I'll introduce um, the project that I coordinate, the Culvert Prioritization Project, and hopefully I'm going to leave you all inspired to hound me for resources and how to get um, get involved and get um, join the effort in your states and regions. So I work for the estuary program, and here's a view um, taken by my colleague Steve Stan is retired. Um, but this is a Bear Mountain Bridge, and we have the beautiful Hudson with the fall colors. So the mission of the estuary program is to help people enjoy, protect, and revitalize the Hudson River and its valley. So we are a um, watershed basin program, and we are organized around six key benefits. So they're listed down here. Where's my mouse? There we go. So they're listed over here. I dwell mostly in the realm of clean water and resilient communities, but we also all um, overlap with various projects into these other categories. So I want to start my talk. Oh, sorry, what was that? Oh, I think it was just a little bit of an echo, maybe. Oh, okay, I apologize. I'm in this little rectangular room in New Paltz. I'll try and speak a bit more clearly if that helps. Um, so I wanted to clarify first that natural barriers exist. Um, so we're not trying to level waterfalls or rapids. And that not all of the infrastructure that we're going to be talking about is a barrier. So this is a um, shameless plug of my dog with a very nice um, bridge that gets up and out of the floodplain here in Asopus. So when we're talking about culverts in the realm of the prioritization project, we're looking at structures that allow water to flow underneath the road from one side to the other. And in New York State, we consider them um, 20, they can be up to 20 feet wide and then over 20 feet, um, according to DOT standards, they're technically classified as a bridge, but you can definitely have a 20 foot wide culvert, um, just some folks will consider that a bridge. So it's just like a funny little technicality we've learned over the years. Um, and though I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about dams, I also wanna acknowledge that aquatic barriers are numerous and a big part of that are dams. So we have about 1500 um, dams in our watershed and our watershed covers um, all the way, the river all the way from the Federal Dam at Troy down to New York City at the Battery and all of the, um, the mountains and valleys that drain into the Hudson. So mostly New York, but parts of New Jersey, um, Massachusetts and Connecticut as well. So road stream crossings are everywhere. I never uh, really saw them until I took this position and now I see them everywhere. I have a great habit of rubbernecking and spotting culverts. Um, in our program so far, we've inventoried and assessed about 9,000 crossings and counting. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this slide with this crowd, but we know that when we have artificial barriers, so we're uh, basically breaking this linear habitat and that can affect um, the quantity of water, so creating areas where we have very little, um, it impacts the, the um, nutrients being transported, water quality, temperature, dissolved oxygen levels. Um, and mostly with the project that I deal with, so I deal with um, trying to reconnect streams in order to restore habitat for migratory fish, like these river herring here in Troy in the Winans Kill. Um, but artificial barriers that we have in the watershed can contribute to loss and degradation of habitat and cut species off. So they become isolated, their numbers take a dive. Um, in some case, cases they can you know, um, suffer from some inbreeding. And it doesn't take a lot to make a barrier. Um, I wanted to put this GIF in my presentation, but I couldn't get it formatted correctly. But if you um, Google salmon jumping, you'll see a fish very similar to the salmon on the West Coast trying to leap into this culvert and ending up smacking its jaw on the culvert and kind of flopping back into the water very sadly. Um, and then in cases on the left with these smaller fish, even if they make this massive jump, um, there is in, insufficient flow in the culvert. So even if you make the jump, you may land into nothing. And it's a very, very sad thing. So what does the estuary program do with culverts? Um, so the first step of our project, we conduct um, assessments using the North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity Collaborative. And that's a way to inventory um, public road stream crossings and assess them for what we call passability. How easy is it for fish and wildlife to get from upstream to downstream? And this includes fish and it also includes terrestrial animal, animals um, and riparian animals. So our turtles, our salamanders. Um, I collected a mink. Um, that was unfortunately deceased from right on top of a culvert my first year, so thinking of mammals as well. 
And through our partnership with uh, Cornell University at the Water Resources Institute, we model these culverts for their flooding capacity. So to what, um, what is the maximum storm size that we think that they're able to accommodate without spilling over the road and starting to create damage. Currently in this effort, um, what I have the most fun with is working with our communities to develop management plans. So really taking a look at the data that we collect in the field and sitting down with community members, the town board, the highway superintendent, and saying, you know, hey, what are your problem areas? And we also are um, comparing that with crossings that would be beneficial to replace for fish and wildlife. So then we get to having some, designing some replacements for barriers that are undersized and also would reconnect um, good habitat for fish and wildlife. And then we are very fortunate enough to have a grants program to um, fund construction. So actually implementing structures that are fully passable and resilient to communities. And we're also able to fund um, this management and design work as well through, um, through new ethic. Great. Um, so this is the NAC. I'm sure some of you have um, are interacting with this already. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. They're absolutely wonderful to work with. So currently at the estuary program, we are operating mostly with this non-title assessment um, protocol. Um, but in the future, we hope to implement the title um, risk of failure and the terrestrial protocols as well, so we can get some more data. This is just an example of um, the workflow of the Python of the script that we use with WRI. So it is mostly based in GIS and Python. Um, and at the moment, it currently models crossings in a vacuum, but we're hoping with future development, we can start to model crossings in series to see how they influence one another with, with um, impounding and kind of holding water back, even though that's not the best thing and not quite what our roads are designed for. And what we like about this is that we work with um, climate data from the Northeast, um, Northeast Climate Institute, and we're able to project out um, for climate change. So increased storms, increased um, precipitation here in the Northeast, especially. So when we get our results back, we're getting results back for current, current precipitation conditions and projecting out into 2050. Here is the obligatory map slide that probably not everybody can read. Um, my apologies. So this is also what our watershed looks like. Here's the Federal Dam at Troy, the Battery. Um, this is the New York, New Jersey line. It's kind of like the Shadowlands of um, too often. <laughs> um, but this is a uh, this this um, map is about six feet tall and about three feet wide and I can send big PDF copies if anyone would like it. But each one of these colorful dots is a culvert that we've inventoried and each one of these blocks is a dam. So really when we zoom out and we're looking at our stream networks they're really under stress just by being cut off from one another. And this we could not have done this without the help of many partners um, that includes counties, municipalities, the folks at Cornell, soil and water agencies, not-for-profits in the private sector. And actually, I'm going to show you all really quickly. So this is a mapper that we maintain on Cornell University's website uh, for the Water Resources Institute. And we have an interactive Google map. It's pretty simple, um, but we have examples of our success stories. So I showed you fish from the Winans Kill. They are right here. We can click on them. We can get some information of the project and when the barrier was mitigated. Um, we also have these purple polygons, and that just shows our partners where we're working. Um, so to give people a heads up to expect us. And then I want to zoom into here. So I mentioned the NAC database, so we have a success story here. Yay! Um, and I wanted to zoom in in particular to a one of our partner sites at Scenic Hudson because this crossing is slated to be going out. There we go. So on each one of these stars, it's, you can see that it's a culvert, you can see the sub-watershed, the town, how does it rank with that NAC, pa that NAC passability score, and what does Cornell say about it? So this crossing is a severe barrier for aquatic organisms, and it's also undersized. So we expect that this isn't able to pass even the one-year storm, or the storm that it arrives multiple, well, there's the statistical chance that it will arrive multiple times a year. And what we've done with each of these, we've embedded a link and you can click right on this link and it'll take you to, again, our handy NAC database. And it'll show you pictures, you know, what exactly does this culvert look like? So looking right inside the cul right inside the crossing, we can see that there's no water, it's buckled in places, it's very dark. Not necessarily what I'd like, where I'd like to hang out if I was a fish, I wouldn't go up there. But I'd be tempted to because downstream, we, again, we have Black Creek. 
from my earlier slide. And it has it's this really, um, really productive, high quality habitat. And this is a tidal tributary mouth. So it leads right to the Hudson River. So it's where a migratory fish would be spawning. Jump back in there. There we go. Um, so our regional partnerships are essential, especially with um, our planning and prioritization. This is just an example slide from some work that our partners at Trout Unlimited have done at, a, at um, localities in Columbia County. And about two thirds of the crossings that we assess, most of them are under the jurisdiction of towns. About um, a third are the responsibility of either New York State DOT or county agencies. And then the rest of them kind of fall to town. So a town could have as many as, I think the most we've seen so far is about 170 crossings to take care of. And the towns have the smallest budget to do that. So we can see that a lot of these crossings were, um, we focus on crossings that are moderate to severe barriers. We can see that a lot of these are some form of barrier to aquatic organisms. And many of them are undersized even when considering um, something like the 10 year storm. And then with climate change, we kind of see some like creeps. So we see more crossings that um, aren't able to pass the five-year event or the 10-year event. So this is an example of um, something that we were able to do um, a few years ago here, here with estuary program grants. This is the town of Ancrum. So it's a town in Columbia County and they're currently going through our prioritization process with um, Trout Unlimited. This is a crossing on Pats Road. So we can see that it's our kind of stereotypical metal culvert. It's small, it's crushed. Um, we can even see some decay happening here where the metal is just rusting and rotting away. And this was a particular concern for the town because um, this road is very important for residents down here to connect to the main highways, to the hospital roads. Um, and a closure of this road leads to about a like 10 minute detour, which in an emergency situation could be huge. So this was a high priority for the town to fix. Um, it led to um, about three about three miles of upstream tributary habitat that we wanted to reconnect for American eel, one of our other signature species. So the town received a estuary grant from us to fund a replacement structure. This is what that structure looked like earlier this year. So we went from a three foot wide um, a three foot wide um, round culvert to a um, fully embedded box culvert. So we restored um, substrate through the channel. It's open. It's very bright. This is a group of highway superintendents that are all kind of um, talking shop up there. And here are some of our partners, Tracy Brown from Trout Unlimited, um, Cornell Cooperative Extension, the Housatonic Valley Association who helped us with put on the workshop and get this work done. So we recognize like with our towns that we're not gonna be able to do, um, not every town is going to want this or have interest in doing crossings like that. So we're really going through our prioritization process and the management plan process to figure out what are solutions that work well for towns and also speaking for the Hudson River, what works well for its migratory fish species and making sure that all of our structures are resilient to climate change. Sign me up, you must be wondering. Um, so we here at the Estuary Program offer trainings at least uh, once or twice a year. Um, so we have some folks from the Adirondack chapter of the Nature Conservancy who came down. We have some soil and water technicians. We even ha had some people from um, Long Island come up and get trained as well. So the easiest way to sign up and get involved is shoot me an email after this presentation um, and let's see what we can do to like get this up the ground because there's a lot of work happening in a lot of great places and we found that this work is really, um, it's a really, is an interesting chance and it's a wonderful chance to work with, you know, partners and agencies that we've never considered in the past. So we're continuously asking our partners, what can we do to help? We're finding that there's a high emphasis, not just on our technical support team that goes over assessing the crossings, but being able to listen and forge connections. So we pride ourselves in stakeholder engagement at the estuary program. And it's been a very, um, it is slow going at times, what we've been finding, but it's very high quality forming these relationships and being able to work with people. So I believe I'm about at 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Here is that same crossing from another view. And the reason why Tracy is kind of tucked in there is because it's about 30 degrees this day. Um, and here are some of our other partners with Cena Hudson and former um, Student Conservation Association AmeriCorps members assessing crossings. My contact information um, is up here and I can absolutely email at any supplies or get in touch with anyone. I think I'm gonna try and transfer control back over to you, Audra. 
So again, you can type in any questions that you have. Um, and I, I will jump back. There was a question that I missed earlier for Emily. Uh, someone typed in, what would be the most common actions under the rehabilitation category? Yeah, sure. So looking at um, rehabilitate, that would be things like uh, removing excessive fill or debris, as I showed in the slide where there was a ton of debris and an encroachment into that stream. Um, it would be remeandering, so changing the path of the stream. Anything that would require um, more extensive equipment, like not just planting or um, a green infrastructure practice upstream, but actual in-stream, um, like reconstruction type of activities. Okay, thank you so much. And we'll move on to uh, another question, and I'm, I have a question for both Emily and Megan. Have either of your organizations done any analysis on what the cost of completing all the needed restoration would be? Um, I can start. Um, the short answer would be no, not quite. Um, but we have uh, gotten a better idea for um, individual structures with going through this intensive process with the towns. And for the structures that we're recommending, um, so fully passable to organisms, reconnecting the stream with its flood, flood, um, flood plain, and then being um, fully passable. So we require that our grantees, when they design or construct, they need to at least pass the 100-year event. Um, but we are seeing about, for each crossing, it could be about 100,000. Um, so $100,000 for you know, our perfect in, um, in our perfect scenario, crossing multiply if a municipality is responsible for 100, you know, we can do the multiplication and get that. Um, but we are finding that when we're asking municipalities to do this, we are stressing that this is an investment in their infrastructure. So a lot of the infrastructure is crumbling, so something must be done. And the designs and shapes that we're recommending are intended to last you know, 75 to 100 years, as opposed to um, fixing every time they blow out in a larger storm or rotting away. Yeah, um, this is Emily, and yes, we've been doing a lot of that type of analysis. Um, I'm not really prepared with any numbers at this point. Those are, those are still preliminary at the moment, but um, as I mentioned, we have a forest management framework and a salt marsh management framework as well with costs associated with them, so a lot of the buffer management for streams um, is associated with cost of planting similar to the forest. So. Uh, we're kind of dovetailing on that and then looking at also with our green infrastructure team how much certain green infrastructure interventions would cost um, both individually and as sort of a more neighborhood build out scenario so yeah we're working on figuring out those estimates and they will be in the report uh, when that's published Great questions, guys, and I'm not seeing any more, but I will just give it one minute here. And that is all I have. So thanks again to the presenters and to everyone who to tuned in today, and we will call it a day. Thanks again, and the webinar is ending. <laughs>